The long wet summer of 1940 has become one of the most important British historical memories, a founding narrative of modern Britain. We're told Britain was fighting for its existence. Hitler's forces were massing across the Channel and only the self-sacrificing courage of the Royal Air Force prevented an invasion. Question is, though, how much of this narrative is true? Hello, good to see you at the History Café. This is where we come to talk usually about historical stories everyone knows. Just want to try out some new ideas. I'm John Rosebank. And I'm Penelope Middlebow. At the History Café, we revisit stories that have got stuck in our collective memory, but just don't look quite right to us. So get yourself a coffee, pull up a chair, and let's see what happens. Well, the traditional story goes that Britain was fighting for its existence. Since September 1939, Hitler's German forces had overrun Poland, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium and France, all with shocking ease. Then they'd pushed the British army out of France and sent them scuttling into little boats at Dunkirk. Hitler, we're told, was greedy to invade Britain next. But first, he had to knock the Royal Air Force out of the skies. When, on the 18th of June 1940, Churchill got up in the House of Commons and announced that the Battle of Britain is about to begin, what he meant was a fight to the death in the air that the Germans would have to win before they could cross the Channel. Or so the usual story goes. And from the 10th of July 1940, desperate dogfighting did indeed break out over the Channel. German Luftwaffe bombers were attacking ports and naval bases in southern England. From the 13th of August, they switched to airfields. And by early September... The RAF was on its knees, its runways cratered, its pilots lucky to survive four weeks. And then, inexplicably, the Germans switched tactics again and began the bombing of London that became known as the Blitz. The RAF survived. And on the 17th of September 1940, Hitler was forced to abandon his invasion plan. Churchill declared that Britain had been saved by her airmen. So that may or indeed may not be the way it looks from the British side of the Channel. But the reason we started talking about this episode of the History Café is that things look very different when you look up from your own cup of coffee and glance around the room a bit. Everything changes when you pull up another chair and take a glance at the German documents. Historian Peter Carver-Caressi pointed out years ago, and he worked in British intelligence at the famous Bletchley Park and later attended the Nuremberg war crimes trials. But he pointed out that, quotes, Great Britain was the wrong kind of enemy for the German forces. What he meant was that it was an island as well as having a huge empire. It would take a formidable amphibious campaign to invade it and a worldwide operation to subdue its forces. And Germany was just not equipped for anything of that kind or on that scale. And nobody who mattered in Hitler's Germany seems to have had any taste for an invasion of Britain. German historian Peter Schenk has shown that there had been some speculative contingency planning about a possible invasion of Britain back in late 1939. But since then, none of Hitler's strategists had added any serious thought to it at all. The German army assessed that it would require 100,000 men and 400 medium-sized steamers. The German navy, the Kriegsmarine, reckoned it could perhaps manage to find 15 ships which would be able to carry at most 7,500. And they would only go to sea after the RAF and the British Royal Navy had both been defeated, which they pointed out would make an invasion scarcely necessary. The German army required open flat terrain for its tanks, but that would mean landing in East Anglia. And the Kriegsmarine ruled that out straight away. Transporting an army all the way across the North Sea to get to East Anglia was completely out of the question. German ships might, with some luck, just about limp across the narrow straits of Dover. But that part of the English coast had few decent harbours, and the terrain was just terrible for tanks, with too many cliffs and marshes, the South Downs rising steeply, and beyond them the muddy tree-field wheeled. And that's as far as planning had got by the spring of 1940. From the German perspective, the invasion of Britain looked like a non-starter. 
interest in invading Britain flickered, perhaps rather nervously, after the fall of France in May 1940. After all, the British army had been horribly defeated and forced to evacuate from Dunkirk, leaving all of its heavy gear behind. They left even more precious equipment at a second, and hardly ever remembered, evacuation of over 190,000 soldiers and civilians from other French ports between the 15th and 25th of June. So it would have been the ideal moment for the Germans to press on and attempt an invasion of Britain had they had any viable plans. On the 6th of June 1940, two days after the end of the Dunkirk evacuation, Hermann Göring, who was head of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, proposed to Hitler to land planes in British airfields and hit the British while they were down. Actually, there's more to this story, as we'll discover in another conversation at the History Café. Anyway, Hitler replied, quote, do nothing. On the 17th of June, the German Navy asked the OKW, the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, which literally means Overcommand of the Defence Force, which included the German Army, Navy and Air Force. Anyway, the German Navy asked whether it was considering a landing on Britain. You can imagine the naval commanders holding their breath and their relief when they got the answer that, quote, the Führer has not up till now expressed any such intention. Therefore, no preparatory work of any kind has been carried out. Hitler's attention was said to be on the East and not on Britain. But the naval men were clearly still worried. On the 21st of June, they sought formal reassurance from the German army. The army, they were told, quotes, is not concerning itself with the question of England. Considers execution impossible. General staff rejects the operation. On the 30th of June, Alfred Jodl, the second most senior officer in the German Reich, submitted a discussion paper on, quotes, the continuation of the war against England. The next day, General Halder, the army chief of staff, sent a request to the Ordnance Office for extra tanks. Perhaps he wanted to be prepared just in case. However, he was firmly informed that, quotes, the invasion of England was not being considered. So there's just no getting away from it. When you look at the German side of things, there can be no doubt at all Hitler's regime had absolutely no long-term plans to invade Britain, nor any immediate intention to think about it. The reality was that there was only a short window of opportunity between the fall of France in late June and late September when the weather in the Channel would rule out a seaborne attack. But no sooner had France fallen, on the 22nd of June 1940, than Hitler gave the order to scale his army down, demobilise 35 out of 155 divisions. Fifteen other divisions were transferred away to the Eastern Front with orders to begin preparing for an attack there, which was time for the spring of 1941. Hitler himself went on holiday, relaxing in Paris, visiting Napoleon's tomb, touring the battlefields where he and his dog had run messages during the First World War. And then he went back to Germany and went picnicking along the Rhine. So whatever the British still believe, that Hitler always intended to take Britain along with the rest of Western Europe, there is absolutely no historical evidence that that's true. But then, at the beginning of July 1940, Hitler's attitude suddenly changed. Whatever the British have always thought, German documents from the summer of 1940 couldn't be clearer. Invasion of England, quotes, was not being considered. But at the beginning of July that year, German strategy seems to have changed. At the end of June 1940, Alfred Jodl, the second most senior officer in the German Reich, completed a discussion paper on, quotes, the continuation of the war against England. Hitler had been on holiday since the fall of France, but when he came back, he apparently read Jodl's memo and changed his mind about the possibility of invading Britain after all. On the 2nd of July 1940, General Wilhelm Keitel, chief of OKW, that's the German High Command, issued a very tentative order to begin looking into a possible landing in England. It wasn't until a fortnight later, however, on the 16th of July 1940, and despite strong discouragement from the Navy, the Kriegsmarine, that Hitler issued Weisung, that's Directive Number 16. And it was hardly a ringing battle cry. He wrote, 
I have decided to prepare a landing operation against England and, if necessary, to carry it out. Now, the historian Peter Fleming, who worked in British intelligence like James Bond, the creation of his more famous brother Ian, jokes that Hitler's Directive No. 16, quotes, lacks the crisp, compulsive, off-with-his-head ring, which was a normal feature of Hitler's style. He'd said there would be a landing, if necessary. The operation was codenamed Lion, but it was soon downgraded to the much less impressive-sounding Zeelova, Sea Lion. Now, we'll come back in a later History Café to what Hitler might have been thinking about when he issued Directive No. 16, and why it was expressed in such ambivalent terms. But for now, there's no doubt that whatever the Führer was thinking, preparations for a German invasion got underway. Well, there have been plenty of books that tell the story and accept it at face value. As we dig deeper, we'll discover that all is not what it seems. But it's a good story, and as historians we should certainly consider all sides of the case. It certainly looks as if the Germans had set their sights on the white cliffs of Dover, the rolling hills of England and the red buses of London. German historian Peter Schenk has analysed records for the German rank and file, the ordinary soldiers and junior officers stationed along the Channel during 1940. He discovered that the lower ranks from each of the services put their heads together and tried to make an invasion a practical reality. Since their senior officers had apparently made absolutely no preparations, the task was completely immense. To invade, the Germans would have to ship tens of thousands of men, as we said, tanks, guns, trucks and horses over to Britain, then supply them across the Channel probably for several weeks until the enemy surrendered. So during July and August 1940, German engineers converted 174 larger merchant ships into troop carriers. They were given new life belts and waste disposal, straw sacks for soldiers and stalls for horses, and rotating wooden platforms for guns. In tests, they scored six near misses from 40 rounds, but that had to do. Six near misses. They also had to turn a blind eye to fire regulations and the required minimum speed of 12 knots. In the end, they dropped it to eight knots. And that meant the prospect of blundering across the channel at nine miles per hour. Now, British destroyers could get up to 40. But the German Navy calculated that even if you added all of its ships and all of Germany's seagoing merchant navy together, they had between them only sufficient ships to carry about half a dozen army divisions at a time. Each division had about 10 or 20,000 men. Army planners were discussing sending 13 divisions or more. The most pressing need in the summer of 1940 was therefore to find more boats. They added motor fishing boats, mostly crewed by lads between 15 and 17 years old. Since they weren't expecting the boats, or indeed the young lads, to make it back, they fitted them with guns so that they could cover the troops they put ashore. But even if the boats ever got the troops across, there were no proper landing craft for pulling up on the English beaches. Except that as two prototype Pioneer Landungs boat on, Pioneer Landing Boats, somebody had found and which proved unsatisfactory. So they experimented with 50 miles an hour flat bottom speedboat troop carriers they could drive straight up onto the beaches. It is tempting to think that these Truppen Transport Tragvlachen Schnellboten were just too long winded to use, but in fact they were simply not strong enough for the channel swell. So for foot soldiers, the Germans requisitioned thousands of ordinary small boats and rubber dinghies. Rubber dinghies? Rubber dinghies. To carry tanks and trucks, they seized 2,000 of the barges labouring up and down rivers in Germany and the countries they'd occupied. This was a major industrial enterprise. Engineers systematically set about raising the barge sides against the channel swell and strengthening their keels with steel and concrete. They cut a large hole in their bow to fit a landing ramp. And most of these barges were normally towed up and down rivers and canals by horses. So the Kriegsmarine assembled a fleet of 386 tugs and trawlers to tow them across the channel. Until they were needed, the barges were kept dispersed in rivers and canals where they were less obvious and more difficult for the RAF to bomb but they installed speakers on the harbour wall at Dunkirk so they could pump out stirring music when they finally did assemble.
From the middle of July 1940, the German rank and file along the coast facing Britain worked with extraordinary energy to create a fleet of some kind. Well, any kind, anything that could transport an army across and launch an invasion. Well, the Kriegsmarine estimated that all this shipbuilding and rebuilding would require the total output of Germany's steel mills for 10 days and all the labour in the available dockyards. This would halt repairs to destroyers and the construction of Germany's essential Unterseeboten, the U-boats, the submarines. Commandeering so many barges could wreck the German economy and risk losing support in Berlin because the capital might run short of coal and food. The German Gross Admiral Erich Raeder, the man in charge of the Navy, was therefore pushed in to ask Hitler for the highest authorization so that Operation Sea Lion would take first place over other economic and strategic demands. Maybe to his own surprise, he got it. But even this was still not enough. So down on the Cotentin Peninsula in occupied France, German engineers started trying to construct rafts out of bridge girders. Then they had to go with aircraft floats and fuel tanks. They even tried bobbing about on wine barrels. But a test voyage across the 20 kilometres to German-occupied Jersey showed that many of their rafts wouldn't make it across the channel, and the rest only in calm conditions. So it was back to the bridging girders, bolting them to barges and building huge catamarans. For power, they added on old aircraft engines and propellers. Then, of course, if they were going to fight their way from the beaches, they would need floating tanks. Up on the North Sea island of Silt, German engineers sealed up a Panzer III tank, fitted it with a floating snorkel, painted it sea green and lowered it into seven metres of water. Uh, they found that so long as it kept moving and didn't get bogged down, it hit a rock or sink into a trench, they could drive it successfully to the shore. Smaller Panzer IIs were fitted with large aluminium floats, turning them into Schwinnpanzerin, swimming tanks, which could churn their way inshore at about five kilometres an hour, even when the sea turned choppy. By the end of August 1940, German engineers had cobbled together over 250 amphibious tanks, ready to land on the English coast. Uh, but if that is, they could only find some way to launch them. The problem was lowering or driving them off the boats offshore. They commandeered four railway ferries for the job, but after weeks of work converting them, they realised they would be far too easy a target. So the engineers set about transforming some of the barges for the job instead. And while all this engineering was going on at the coast, back in Berlin, Walter Schellenberg, effectively head of the Nazi elite SS intelligence, put his mind to what would happen if and when an invasion of England was successful. He was apparently drawing up a Sonderfahndungslist GB, that is, a list of 2,820 undesirable Britons. It included intelligence agents and obvious targets like the President of the World Committee Against War and Fascism, Norman Angel. There were also émigrés from Germany and its occupied territories, including General de Gaulle, one Baron Frankenstein, and John Hertfield, the Berlin artist whose photomontage cartoons had been bitingly critical of the Nazis. But the list also included politicians like Harold Nicholson, writers diverse as Bertrand Russell and Noel Coward, newspaper proprietors like Lord Beaverbrook, who was also actually in charge of aircraft production, company directors, trade unionists, communists, pacifists like Vera Britton, senior clergy, scientists and other academics, and well-known individuals like Virginia Woolf, who'd been openly critical of fascism. 20,000 copies of the list were printed for issue to SS Einsatzgruppen, special action squads. In Poland and the Soviet Union, Einsatzgruppen were responsible for a series of cold-blooded massacres, lining up Jews and suspected subversives in mass graves and gunning them down. But SS plans for Britain were at least at first to arrest those on the list and take them to questioning in London, Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, Edinburgh or Glasgow. A few were to be deported to Berlin. To take over in Britain after the invasion, the SS appointed the sinister SS Brigade Führer, Dr Alfred Six. Six was also instructed to target public schools because they were places, quotes, 
calculated to rear men of inflexible will and ruthless energy who regard intellectual problems as a waste of time, but know human nature and how to dominate other men in the most unscrupulous fashion. He was also ordered to wind up the Freemasons, the Salvation Army, and even the Boy Scouts, since that movement was obviously just, quotes, a camouflaged but powerful instrument of British cultural propaganda. The Germans believed the Boy Scouts was actually a part of British intelligence. According to all this evidence, had Hitler ever given the order to invade, a weird water world flotilla would have bobbed out from the Channel ports sometime late in the summer of 1940, including many unpowered barges lashed together and towed by motorboats. The men aboard would have been equipped with rocket-assisted cliff-scaling wires, portable flamethrowers and a list of undesirable British writers, politicians and organisations. They would have been backed by amphibious tanks set to emerge from under the waves and chug in shore. In his book on Operation Sea Lion, Leo McKinstry has argued, as many have before, that, quote, the assembly of the huge invasion fleet in a short time scale was not only a phenomenal feat of logistics, but also a direct contradiction of the idea that the Germans were never serious about crossing the Channel. Well, maybe he's right, but that is only one side of the argument. Through July and August 1940, the Germans put together the most extraordinary flotilla of troop-carrying craft and floating tanks. Well, it's convinced many writers that even though the Nazis had no long-term intention to invade Britain, in the course of that summer they changed their minds. All this astonishing military energy along the Channel Coast looks like a serious campaign to cross over and invade. But if you dig deeper, another story begins to emerge. The German documents also show that the technical challenge facing the German engineers and planners was Herculean. From a standing start on the 16th of July 1940, they had about 10 weeks to contrive, build, test, assemble, rehearse and launch a huge amphibious invasion before the autumn weather would swamp their flimsy rafts and drown their tanks. It was never remotely realistic. Until long after the summer of 1940, German engineers never resolved absolutely fundamental problems for an amphibious attack, for example, how to make a beach landing on a rising tide, or how to get their clever new amphibious tanks over the basic but jaggedly effective tank barriers the British had put up in every possible landing place. With the motley flotilla of boats they'd collected and constructed, it would have taken day after murderous day just to offload the first wave of troops and their equipment at the shoreline. And then they'd have to face the problem of supply lines, stretched for weeks across the Channel, harassed continuously by, we must remember, the best navy in the world. At the time, Hitler later privately admitted to his naval adjutant that attempting to invade Britain could have cost the Reich in one night many times the 30,000 lives lost taking France. After examining all the documents, the German historian Peter Schenk concludes, quotes, no military commander in his right mind would have given the order to proceed. It begins to be more and more obvious why Hitler only ordered his forces to attempt it if necessary. It makes you question just how serious about crossing the channel, in McKinstry's phrase, the Germans actually were. But if they weren't, what on earth were all these breathless preparations for? We're clearly going to have to think more deeply about what exactly the Germans thought they were doing. But before we go there, we need to address one other glorious and venerable founding myth of modern Britain. Surely it will be said, even a shambolic mishmash of patched up barges and rusty girders could have got across the Channel if only the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, could have given it air protection. The great story the British have always told about 1940 is that whoever won air superiority would win the battle for Britain. Well, is that true? We'll find out next time at the History Cafe. For more on this story and others at our History Cafe, go to historycafe.org. There you'll find information about us and also about further reading you can do. It's also a way to ask us any questions you might have. Music